I love drawing trees and I always have. I've been drawing trees most of my adult life. And what I'm obsessed with is not the tree in its entirety, but the moment that the trunk intersects the earth. The physical embodiment of singular, unconditional, bulletproof placement. The marking of a location. A vertical thrust into a horizontal plane. Seems to embody everything I'm after in the paintings, uh, all compressed into that very, very physical, immediate moment, that intersection. A lot of the conceptual framework in my paintings is, is, uh, is found in this, in this type of study. And it's very, very important to me to learn how to render the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional surface. The great German artist Walter Sickert said that drawing is about captivity and painting is about freedom. So. I'm really invested in that notion of capturing something and, and using that as, as a springboard into the process of abstraction. I do consider myself a nature painter who arrives at my paintings through the process of abstracting, which implies that it must be removed from something or from somewhere. And for me, it's from this physical moment. I've never felt that I needed a position in my work because I have a place, and that place is very much marked by this bullseye, by that moment of that intersection of trunk to ground. talk about the word memory for a minute as it as it applies to the process of abstraction and also to my paintings in specific you often hear that word bandied about he or she works from memory or so-and-so's work is about memory neither is true in my case I do not work from memory nor do I consider my paintings to be about memory in fact I'm not even convinced that any painting of any period can be about memory I love looking at Emanuel Lutz's Washington Crossing the Delaware. And yes, that painting is a recounting of an event in our collective history, but to me the real power and import of that painting is that it enacts place. That it's, that it's the physical manifestation of a series of events, of manipulations of material over a long period of time which culminate into an image which completely consumes and overwhelms the viewer in that moment. It's a very, very immediate visceral experience. So it's very, very important to me in my own work that my paintings enact place, that they reveal a series of physical decisions of finger, fingerprints, marks, over a range of time available right in front of the viewer to, to address in that moment. Hopefully, hopefully grafting their sensibilities onto those decisions, onto those marks, and having an experience of their own. So for me, memory implies that, that some event long ago had to have made an impression upon me, or I had to have been seduced in some way. So in order to work from memory, it connotes a recreation of that initial seduction. And that's the word I have a problem with, recreation. To recreate seduction almost sounds like kitsch to me. And I, I very, very much like seduction, and I like the, the luxurious and seductive possibilities of oil paint. And I really love kitsch. I was born and raised in a resort town in, in artificial environments. We go to Las Vegas twice a year and Disney World at least once a year for that reason. We were just in San Francisco for an opening and our friends took us to the Tonga Room, which is a tiki-inspired cocktail lounge. And it was fabulous. It was, I was so, so happy. I love tiki-themed things. So I'm very comfortable in the notion of the ridiculous and the absurd of new things made to look old. Of, of artificial columns and, and you know phony spider webs at Halloween, uh, the, the, and 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 the whole notion of of, uh, of of bad taste, I'm very very interested in and comfortable with uh, the notion of artifice, and that certainly plays a very very important role in my work. Uh, I am involved in creating artificial experiences all day long, but they don't end there. They have to go beyond that beyond the, the, the ideal of kitsch, or the, the, uh, the, the position of kitsch. And one of the things I love so much about trees, of looking at trees, and especially drawing trees, is that they embody a singular, immediate thrust, a vertical 
thrust into a horizontal context. Something immutable, something immovable, a complete uh, uh, marking of location. Not about memory, but about the moment, the immediate moment. And sometimes that's interesting to contrast to an experience like swimming. Often when I'm swimming, I'll think about not only how good this cold water feels, but, but how different this experience feels from standing on the land with the ground connected to your feet. That notion of being suspended and immersed and disoriented in, in an ambiguous liquid world is very much a part of, of uh, what I try to do in my work, in the process, to negotiate those two modes of experience. One very physical, very real, very tangible. The other uh, more liquid, more imaginary, uh, more ephemeral. And I like the idea that you can't be in both at the same time. It's either one or the other. Indeed, the, one of the beautiful things about any painting, the experience of any painting, is that one must have all one's mental faculties on hair trigger alert. It, it requires that a complete investment on our part. Uh, both physically and intellectually. So it's very, very important to me that I not be in the business of recreating anything, but in the business of creating something. In the moment, immediate, with no tricks, uh, no illusions, everything you need is right there on the surface. You can see how it's made. You can touch it. It's physical. It's in the room with you. It's, 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 it, it's on the wall in your space. Um, when is the moment when, when the outside world becomes private experience? That split second when outside becomes inside. That's the moment I want to freeze in my paintings. And to do so, it's very important that I, that I, that I not be concerned with reliving an experience, but with the total possessing of it. That dictum, start like a bricklayer, finish like a jeweler, I believe was originally said by Walter Sickert. And I know I chatter on and on about Sickert, but I, I value his work very much. And it was also told to me by Michael Tyzak, my teacher in college, which makes perfect sense because Tyzak was a British painter. Anyway, it brings me into a look at Charles Hawthorne, the American Impressionist painter, who I've been thinking about lately. Here's a, uh, a Hawthorne watercolor from 1929. And Hawthorne always talks about the importance of composing with large, open masses of color to create a very elemental, very muscular and open and, and simple design. And he passes that on to Edwin Dickinson, who learns a great deal from Hawthorne. Dickinson is also a very, very interesting painter who refers to a similar idea in his color spots, the way he composed in placing a very carefully mixed color down, then mixing a second color, placing it in proximity to the first, and then third, fourth, fifth, on and on and out, spiraling out from that original decision, and creating a composition that's both harmonious in color and also has a sense of expansion and contraction and I think also promulgates a, a spatial anticipation of one area to the next area to the next. Um, a very satisfying experience. And here are a couple of paintings of mine I'm currently working on. These are about maybe halfway through. But you can see in those early stages there are large areas of color and that comes from, from Hawthorne's example. Very large, open, to create a sense of muscularity and clarity and economy in those initial compositions. Even though I may change things and, and add later on, that anchor, that keystone of that simplicity of design remains from the very beginning. Hawthorne was also fond of saying, swing a bigger brush, you have no idea what you're missing. And uh, <laughs> I love that, that statement. I mean, how many other areas in life can one say something like that? I love my job. Mm -hmm.